Okay, so how is everyone today? Good, I hope. So this week we have uh, two quizzes back to normal. That's good. Any questions about any logistic matters before we continue going over new things? Okay. <clears throat> so, last time, oops. last time uh, we were talking about <coughs> integration. And the main result from last time was this result. Is that <coughs> integral from A to B, integral from C to M of f of x and y dy dx Uh, is the same as the double integral <coughs> over the region of f of x and y dx dy, which is the same as the iterated integral c to m, a to b, f of x and y <coughs> uh, d x dy. So these three things are all the same. And the name of this result is called Fubini's theorem. And to remind you the geometry of each one of these <clears throat> is that this, uh, this one is, if you like, cutting volumes into certain bread slices. This one is cutting volumes into certain other bread slices that are facing the other direction. And this one is cutting things into french fries, <laughs> is the way that it looks. So uh, this one, because you're holding x is fixed, these, these bread slices would be slices that are facing us. So they would look like um, bread slices that look like this. Whereas this one, these are, these are bread slices that are edge, uh, edge on to us. And the, this kind of integration is when you're cutting it into french fries. And the, the <coughs> Fubini result is that it doesn't matter how you cut the volume into, um, <coughs> into such pieces when you're making your accounting because you'll obtain the same volume no matter how you proceed. Uh, so there's, there's several conditions that are required, but I'm not mentioning them. Um, one of the things that, because I'm a mathematician, I have to say is that if this is true, if the function is a if the function f is a nice function, um, <clears throat> so essentially every function that you'll ever 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 deal with is a nice function. It's it's a continuous function. It's extremely well behaved. Fine. Uh, this Fubini's theorem will be true. <clears throat> But as a mathematician, I have to warn you that in the wide world, 
the wide universe of all possible functions, I can come up with functions where all three of these are different. You cut it into bread slices like this, you get one answer. You cut it into bread slices like that, you get a different answer. And you cut it into french fries like this, and you get even a different answer. Okay. <clears throat> now, this is true. Uh, possible when the region is a rectangle. That is to say that we have a less or equal x less or equal b. <coughs> and c less or equal y less or equal m. This is a rectangle because all of these are constant. And if we were to plot this, on an xy plane, this would be the region, a rectangle. But we don't want to limit ourselves to such a possibility. We don't want to say that, well, we're only ever going to be able to integrate over a rectangle. What if we wanted to integrate over a circle? <coughs> OK. So what that corresponds to is that when you're doing iterated integrals, iterated integrals, and not all of the limits are constant. When all of the limits are constant, then you're integrating over a rectangle. When some of them are not constant, you're integrating over something that is not rectangular. So let's have an example of doing that. Let's see, did we do one last time? Yeah, I think we did one. <coughs> so now we're going to do one uh, that requires some thought. How about integral 0 to 16, integral square root y to 4 of square root of x cubed plus 4 dx dy. OK. So in the first place, um, are we integrating over a rectangle? So is the, is the region of integration a rectangular region? Why or why not? So remember, the previous page, part of the discussion, <coughs> is that Fubini's, you, you can do this kind of thing, like this, when the region that you're integrating over is a rectangle, which is to say all of these are constants, A, B, C, and M. So how about in the current exercise? Or all the, so what I'm asking, my question was, the region we're integrating over, is it a rectangle? That's the same, so, so why not? Right, three of them are constants, but that's not enough, right? We're integrating from 0 to 16, both of those are constant, that's good. 
4, that's a constant. That's nice. Square root of y, that's not a constant. OK. So then we're not, we're not integrating over a rectangle. So we can't use Fubini's in sort of the, the trivial way. We can't just swap the order of these two. What would tell us immediately that, that would be wrong about this if we were to try to just swap them? Okay, let me, let me write it. So, so what I want is for you to evaluate this, and my question to you is, is I'm going to write something, and I want you to tell me how, with an immediate glance and nothing more, you can tell me that this is wrong beyond saving. This is irredeemably wrong. How can you tell at a glance? Okay, I'm not sure I follow. What you what you mean? Well, that that's in principle. There, that's okay in principle. That this could be constant with respect to y. That part's okay. But there's something about this that is just not okay. Which one? What's wrong with the outer integral? Well, the problem is, is that we have, is that the outermost integral has to be between constants. The limits have to be between constants. So this one, notice, this is 0 to 16. That's good, because those outer limits are constant. Are the outer limits here constant? They're not constant. So I'm going to put three exclamation marks. <laughs> so I'm, I'm telling you this <clears throat> because the graders will be under <laughs> instructions to take, take pick such questions with responses like this and just give them a zero. Okay, so you just can't do this. Now, if you were integrating over a rectangle, then you could do it. By the way, to, to be clear about what I did, I just, took, I just took these two positions and I swapped them. I swapped those and I swapped these. That's all that I did to get from here to here. But you just can't do it because of that. Now, if we were integrating over a rectangle, you could do it and it would be exactly what you want. So that's nice. But don't think that it can that it continues to be that nice. It's only that nice when you're integrating over a rectangle. <clears throat> okay. So we can't invoke Fubini's theorem in the usual way on this integral. So can we integrate it? Can we integrate it? So if we were to proceed, we'd need to do the following integral. We'd need to do the inner one first, because that's the way these work.
we need to do that one. That's just me copying that middle one. So can we do that? Let's think about it. Well, you got to think back to all of your fun integration at the beginning of this course and at the end of 1325. So how many antiderivatives do we know in our class? Three. Okay, they are, <coughs> we know the power rule, which is the antiderivative of x to n, and that becomes x to n plus 1 over n plus 1, plus a constant. And of course, that's true for almost every value of n, except negative 1. We can't. We can't stomach doing it with negative 1, because if we were to attempt to do that, we'd divide by 0, which is not permissible. Okay, in the one case when n is negative 1, that is to say antiderivative of x to negative 1, well, you usually don't write x to negative 1. You usually write 1 over x. So this is, this is the case when, x is ne when, sorry, when n is negative 1. What is the antiderivative in this case? Very good. Log of the absolute value of x plus a constant. And then there's just one more. What's the other one? The exponential. So antiderivative of exponential is exponential itself. So those are the only three antiderivatives that we know in our class. That's not the only three that are known to mankind, but that's the ones that we know in our class. Is this one of those? Or can we do something to transform it into one of those? Supposing I do that. So can we distribute the exponent? No. <laughs> no, exponents don't distribute across sum. They don't do that. Maybe we could do a substitution. What do you think? You try one? Okay, what would you want to try? U is what? Okay. If anything would work, that would be the first thing to try the thing that's in the radical. So then, if u is x cubed plus 4, then du should be 3x squared dx. So would someone please comment about this situation? So is this, is this tenable? Can we make this work? This substitution work? We can't make it work, right? Because to make it work, we would need an x squared somewhere. Besides, besides this x cubed plus 4, which we're trying to cover up with u, we'd need x squared somewhere. Is there any x squared hanging around for us to be happy with? No. There's no x squared. So what I want you to see is that, in a sense, we're currently stuck. What would we do? What could we do? So <clears throat> what we want to do, what we're going to try, we want to use Fubini's.
to change. the order of integration. The reason why we want to do that is because when looking at this, when we're trying to do x first, there's nothing we can do. But looking at this for a moment, what if we were trying to I ignore the limits and the fact that this whole box is just wrong, but look at this for a moment. Could you anti-differentiate that with respect to y? Would you know how to compute the antiderivative of it with respect to y? The answer is, yeah, it'd be trivial to do with respect to y, because x is constant with respect to y. So that's, that's like, you know, 4. What's the, what's the antiderivative of 4 dy? 4y. What's the antiderivative of 10 dy? 10y. What's the antiderivative of that thing, dy? <laughs> that thing, y, right? OK, we, we want to use Fubini's to change the order of integration but we can't do it the easy way. Okay, so we're gonna have to do it the hard way. So these limits, these limits, So those limits imply bounds on x and y. So which, which ones are the y limits? Which of those is the y limits? Zero to 16, right? Because, because y is on the outside, so y's limits are on the outside. These are the x x limits, y limits, x, y. So they imply that 0 is less or equal to y is less or equal to 16, and also that 4 is less or equal, no, that square root y is less or equal to x is less or equal to 4. So can you see uh, how I translated those into these? Okay. Now, from this, I'm going to come up with two, uh, two equations. So this means, this means that y is between y is 0 and y is 16. That's me translating this into slightly different language. So could someone help us translate this into analogous language? This is saying that x is between what? Good. x between x is square root of y and x is 4. So now, y is 0, that's easy to understand. What's y is 0 if you were to plot it? Horizontal line. In particular, it's the x-axis, right? And what's y is 16? Another horizontal line, a little further up. Okay, how about x is 4? What's that? A 
vertical line at position four. And in this one, this one is the one that's slightly entertaining. What is x equal to square root of y? Sorry? Not zero. x equal to the square root of y. It might help you if in your head you solve for y. What would, what would happen if, what would we get if we solved for y? y is x squared. And what is y is x squared? Ah, it's a parabola, right? Our, our lovely parabola. So we're talking about a region that's between two horizontal lines and then a parabola and a vertical line. Let's plot this region. So this line is y is 0. y is 16 is just like that one except further up. Okay, the other one that's easy to do is x is 4. So the, the only thing left is the parabola. So now we need to plot the parabola. But because this is a, <laughs> a designed problem, it's going to end up looking nice. So notably, how about when x is 4? When x is 4 and we want to plot the parabola, what's y? 16. So this point is on the parabola. And similarly, when x is 0, what's y? 0. So this here is the parabola. So this is, <coughs> this part right here is y is x squared. Okay, now I have a question for you. We plotted all the bits. Um, what is the region? It, it's not a rectangle, I agree with that. <laughs> what, what in our in this drawing is the region. Is it, is it this part over here? That bit? No. Right here. So, so this one, but what, why not this one? It, this one or that one? This one? Yeah. Why this one? <laughs> okay. So, so let's consider for a moment. We're talking about we're allowed to select any y between <coughs> zero and sixteen. So let's. That means that we can s select any horizontal line between between these two horizontal lines. So how about how about this horizontal line? So that's a particular horizontal line. Now the question is is when do we enter the region? Well, the left side of the region is when x becomes the square root of y. So when is x the square root of y? right there. So that's the start of the region. 
And then we're, we go all the way to four. So from the square root of y to four. So no, 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 yes, 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 no. Can you see it? So this region is R. Okay, so that's the region that we're talking about. Notably, it's not a rectangle. <clears throat> so now we want, we want a description of region R, and we want it to be like this other description over here, except we want the x's between constants. Between constants. Not the y's. Okay, so can, can someone try and interpret what I could possibly be saying here, requesting? Or, or is it clear what it is that I'm requesting? <clears throat> so what I want you to see is that this description right here, and this description, we're saying that y's are between things and x's are between things. Do you observe that the y's are between constant things, 0 and 16? The x's are not between constant things. What I'm saying is I want, to, I want to describe this in a different way where we're saying that now it's the x's that are between constant things and possibly the y's are not between constant things. So what constant values, x values, is this region between? Just like it's between constant y0 to 16, what's it between for x's? Not quite. So, so for, for the y's, have a look at this region. Is this y value down here part of the region? No, it's not, because it's not passing through the region. So, do, 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 do. Oh, that's where it starts, at 0, right? And then I'm passing through the region all the way up to do, do, do. 16, right? So 0 to 16. <clears throat> My question is, is what values of x pass through the region? So how about these negative values way over here? Are these passing through the region? Nope. When do they start going through the region? Right there. What is that x value? What is this x value? That one's 4. What's this one? 0. That's the origin, right? So what values of x do we have to be between? 0 and 4. So 0 less or equal to x less or equal to 4. Now, what we're going to do <clears throat> is I want you to fill in these boxes. We've got to fill in these boxes. What are the y's between? So we've established the x's are between 0 and 4. What are the y's between? 
<clears throat> well, how about way over here? Is this x value part of the region? It is not, right? Because I'm not passing through the region. How about way over here? No. My board is too cold over here, right? <laughs> So now let's choose an x value that actually passes through the region. So how about this one? So you can see that that green x value passes through, through the region. And now we want to consider what y value, for, for this fixed green x value, what y values are in the region. So how about y values down here? Are, is this in the region? No. So we're going to start sweeping <coughs> in the positive direction for the y's. And you tell me when we get in the region. And I'm going to stay on the green. So do, 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 do. Oh, we made it, right? So what is the least y value? Zero. Okay, then we have to go all the way to what? Okay, so 16 is, is a common first guess, but it's not 16. Let, let's, write, let's write down 16 for a moment, and let's, let's think about what that would mean. The, the answer is not 16, so if you're writing in pen, don't write, it. <laughs> don't write 16. Let's think about this for a moment. Let's think about this. That would mean that the x's are between constants and the y's are between constants. It would be a rectangle. Right. That's, that's, what, this, that's what, what I have written would imply. Is it a rectangle? It is not. Furthermore, what a surprise that would be that, that this description gives something that's not a rectangle, but then we can play around with it and make it one? OK, no, that couldn't be right. So it's the upper limit is not. 16. So here we are on the green x value. These y values are too small, so we've got to go up. So up, up, <coughs> up, 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 up. And then I start there at y is 0. OK? Then now I'm in the region. Yes, 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 yes. Stop. If I go any further, I'll leave. What is the y value for that? x squared. It's x squared. And now, notably, looking at this, do these two conditions, do they describe a rectangle? How can you tell that they do not describe a rectangle? Right. Three of them are constant, but the other one is not constant. Okay. So these are, these are two alternative descriptions of the region. This way, when y's are between constants. This way, when x's are between constants. I'd like to point out that we've done no calculus on this exercise so far. This has been, in, this has been entirely an algebraic endeavor so far. So what that means as a result of that Therefore, we can now invoke Fubini's and, re and reorder the integral, the iterated integral. Uh, oops, three. Three? Yeah, three. It was originally dx dy. Now we're going to make it dy dx. And what I want you to tell me is that what I want you to tell me what goes in these boxes. So what goes, what are the outer limits? I'm sorry? The x values, so what are they? Z zero and four, right? Good. Zero and four. And then what are the inner limits? Zero to x squared.
Okay. Now, I'd like to point out this is true. This is right. So notice that it's, 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 it's much more of a task than just taking these and writing them in the other order. Right? You can't just, bleh, it's not that nice. It's only that nice when you're dealing with a rectangle. When you're not dealing with a rectangle, then you've got to do all this algebra consideration. Okay. <clears throat> so from here, now that we've switched the order of integration, now, now the question is, was that worth it? Was it worth it? So the question becomes, can we proceed? Can you tell me, what is the antiderivative of square root x cubed plus 4 dy? It's easier than you think. It's, it's square root x cubed plus 4. Why? Because what we're doing, we're looking at this inner integral there. What if, what if, uh, what if that, this thing I'm covering up, what if the radical thing was a 5? What's the antiderivative of a 5 dy? 5y. Five because 5 is a constant. What's the antiderivative of 10y? Uh, oh, sorry, 10dy. 10y, because 10 is a constant. What's the antiderivative of square root x squared plus 4dy? Why? Because yeah, that thing is a constant. OK. So then now, we plug in for the y's. And when we do that, we get the square root of x cubed plus 4, and then multiply it by x squared minus 0 dx. Of course, x squared minus 0 is x squared. And then I'll move that x squared to the front of the radical where it may be easier on your eyes to look at. Now what? Now I hope you're getting deja vu of the beginning of the problem, the beginning of the exercise. A substitution? But last time we tried a substitution, it didn't work. Ah, but there's an x squared there now. So does everybody see the joke? Right? You couldn't have done the substitution in the beginning because the x squared wasn't there. But you changed the order of integration and, de and deal with it a little bit, and then, oh, there's the x squared. So <clears throat> u is x cubed plus 4, du over 3 is x squared dx, u evaluated at 0 is 4, u evaluated at 4 is 68. So the new uh, integral is integral 4 to 68, square root u, du over 3. So besides the, 
division by 3, which can be factored out, is this one of the antiderivatives we know? It is. Which of the three is it? So you got a one-third chance if you do a blind guess. The power rule with what exponent? Half. So doing that, this would be a third, and then you to three halves, divide by three halves from four to 68. Division by three halves is multiplication by two thirds, so this would be two thirds. 68 to three halves minus four to three halves. And it doesn't simplify in a nice way after this. Okay, interesting. <clears throat> Any question about this one? So now, the majority of us doing this exercise was just discussion, really. Okay, I, this is, you know, a lot of me writing, this is all just discussion about blah, 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 blah. But is there any question about this? Because now we're gonna do another one, but we're not gonna do it, we're gonna do it with far less discussion. So that you can see that this this is an exercise that's, that's doable, but does require a little bit of work. Okay. So let's have one. So please evaluate the iterated integral 0 to 2 integral y over 2 to 1 exponential of x squared dx dy. Okay. So anytime you're, you're hit with one of these, the first thing you gotta do is ask yourself, well, as for that innermost one, could I do that? Do you know how to compute the antiderivative of the exponential of x squared? Is that one of the three that we know? So I'm getting a maybe look from some of you. <laughs> so let's remind ourselves, the one that you do know that does look a little bit like that is, is the exponential one, right? This one? <clears throat> and I think you may be asking yourself, can I use this rule? And the answer is no, you cannot. You cannot because in the end the requirement is that the thing in this box has to be the same as the thing in this box, right? Exponential of x dx. So looking at our specific uh, exercise, the exponential of x squared dx. And the question becomes, well, is the thing in this box the same as the thing in this box? So are those the same thing? The answer is no. So we can't use that rule. So what should we do? Well, let's think about it the other way. Let's imagine. What if, so I think, I think we're kind of, so no, notably you also could not do a substitution, right? If you were to try u as x squared, you'd need a 2x floating around somewhere. 
So, so a substitution is not going to do it for you either. So what I want you to observe is that you don't know how to anti-differentiate this with respect to x. And I want, what I want you to imagine is, well, even though I'm not sure how to differentiate it with respect to x, what if first I could anti-differentiate it with respect to y? Is that something, could you anti-differentiate exponential of x squared with respect to y? Could you do that? Yeah. In fact, it would be trivially so, because this is constant with respect to y. So you could do that quite easily. So for these reasons, I want you to be led to believe that, oh, it's probably that I need to switch the order of integration. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so in the first place, these limits imply something about um, x's, and they imply something about y's. And I want you to tell me how to fill in these boxes. Okay, so what goes in the in the X boxes? And why? And why? So what goes in these two? y over 2 and 1. Now why is that? Why is it that y over 2 goes in that one and 1 in that one? Right. Because remember that they, the correspondence is like this. These limits correspond to x. These limits correspond to y. So what goes in the y boxes? 0 and 2. OK. So that's, that's the description of the region that was given with the statement of the problem. So now what we're going to do is we want to switch the, uh, the privileged one. right? So here, the y's Y's are between constants. What we want to do is, is re-describe the region so that it is the X's that are between constants. Notice that X's are not between constants. OK. <clears throat> so corresponding to these Y's, uh, well, we have that Y is going to be between, Y is between. y is 0 and y is 2. That's what the y's are between. So can you tell me an analogous statement for the x's? So the x's are between what? <coughs> mm -hmm. So between x is y over 2 and x is 1. Now, these three, x is 1, y is 0, y is 2, those are all easy enough to understand. Those are lines, uh, two horizontal lines, one vertical line. What is this? This one. It's also a line but you're probably just accustomed to looking at it slightly differently. If you were to solve for y, what would, what is this one? <coughs> y is 2x. OK. 
Okay, so let's plot. So what I'm saying is that these two are the same thing. <clears throat> let's plot uh, this circumstance. So this is y is 0. This is y is 2. X is 1, something like this. And then y is 2x. Where does it fit in the picture? OK, 0, 0 is one of the points that's on it. What's another point that's on it? One, two, right. So this okay. So now my question to you is we've drawn all the boundaries. What's the region? The bottom right, the triangle bit that's in the bottom right. Why, why is that the correct region? Well, let's let's think about this for a moment. So, can can we agree? And I hope it's obvious that it's got to be between these two between these two lines. It couldn't be below, and it couldn't be above. That's what this is saying. Okay, then, to color code it, this is the blue thing. That's blue information. And this is green information. So x has to be to the right of the blue and to the left of the green. Which is to say, what if we were to, what if we were to select this particular uh, line, like this one? To the right of the blue, to the left of the green. Blue, green. Can you see it's this triangle down here? Okay, so now we want an alternate description. In the, in the original description, which one was between constants? The y's were between constants. So now we're going to make an alternate description, and what's going to be between the constants? The x's. So now what I'm asking you to do is to write, write down the correct things so that we fill in these boxes. And the y's in principle can be anything, but we're going to insist that we make these constant. So what goes in, in this box? What is the least x that we need consider? So remember, x values are, are, vertical, are vertical lines. So is this vertical line over here going through the region? No, nope, that's not going through the region. How about uh, this vertical line over here? Is that going through the region? No, right? This is, you know, my porridge is too cold, and 
this porridge is too hot and just just in here right so that's going through the region so what is the leftmost x that we need zero and the rightmost one okay then supposing that we've selected such an x like this one So I'm signifying some x by that red line. You can see that not all of the red line is passing through the region, right? This, this part of the red line is too low. This part of the red line is too high. So when do we start going through the region? When, when what? When y is 0. And then we're in the region. Yes, 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 and then we stop there at 2x. Any question about this? So as a result, we, we can now, we, we've now performed this algebraic computation which allows us to switch the order of integration. That is to say, we can write the iterated integral of the exponential of x squared. And instead of dx dy, we can do dy dx. What are the outer limits? Zero to one. And what are the inner limits? Zero to two x. So I'd like to point out that all of, the, all of the work so far, there's been no calculus. This has been entirely an algebraic exercise. To change the description of the region from this kind of description to that kind of description so that we've changed the order of integration. <laughs> if, if, <laughs> remembering that the, that the two different iterated integrals can be anthropomorphized into slicing bread. All of this was just so we could turn the knife the other way. <laughs> we could slice it the other way. <laughs> okay, that, that's all that we've done so far. But now, considering this and ignoring the outer uh, integral for a moment, is that an antiderivative that you're prepared to do? Yeah, that one's easy, right? <laughs> Can you anti-differentiate this constant <laughs> with respect to y? Sure you can. Right? So doing that, you get exponential of x squared, and then multiply by 2x dx. OK, and I hope you're getting deja vu from the previous problem. Because just like we couldn't do a substitution, because bits were missing, now suddenly that we've switched the order of integration and proceed a little, a little bit, oh, all the bits that we need are there now. Okay, so let's do a substitution, but I don't want you to get too attached to you, so I'm going to use a z. So z is x squared, so that dz is 2x dx. z evaluated at 0 is 0, and z evaluated at 1 is 1. so that it becomes integral 0 to 1, exponential of z, dz. Is that one of the three that we know? It sure is. So that's exponential of z 
from 0 to 1. So that's exponential of 1, which is e, minus exponential of 0. What's exponential of 0? So the answer is E minus 1. Terrific. Any question about this? Yeah? Isn't there a rule um, for the last half of the base thing for us to just know which one is the one that's first? I'm not sure what you mean. Do you From the beginning, how we saw here? that. Here? I'm, I'm not following you. <laughs> kind of sleepy? Okay. I get it. Well, I, I, I will warrant the following. I'll say that I have done this in the fastest way possible. This is, there's not a shorter way. And I promise you, for purely selfish reasons, I would display to you the shortest way because it makes my life easier to grade short things. <laughs> There's not a better way to do it. Okay. <clears throat> so now, uh, now we move to something else. So we've, we've finished our discussion of functions of two variables. So I'd like to point out that we did some good things, but, but there's something that's missing that, we're, that in this class we're not going to discuss. So when we were talking about functions that have signature reals to reals, that's the kind of functions you dealt with in Calculus 1. Calculus 1 punctuates by a, a, a major result uh, called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. It, it's telling you the relationship between derivative and antiderivative and integral. And in a huge surprise, you can, you can compute an integral by evaluating an antiderivative at two places. I can't even express how incredible that is. That's called the Fundamental Theorem. Now, we learned how to integrate we learned how to integrate, but the best tool that we could, we could get is Fubini's theorem. And from a procedural standpoint, what Fubini's theorem says is that you can take an iterated integral and sort of um, eat it one, one dimension at a time. You can do the, inner, the innermost integral, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one but there's not kind of a neat, there's nothing, we didn't, weren't able to tie a bow on all that with something really neat like the fundamental theorem. That doesn't mean that there's not something, it just means that that something is not part of our class. And it's a beautiful something that I just have to leave sitting there. So now we're moving to a completely different section. Any questions before we move to a different topic? Okay, the different topic is chapter 10. Differential equations. So the summary of differential equations, uh, I'll, I'll say it like this, since this is an applied calculus course. The summary is that differential equations are the tool, and I'm going to underline the, <laughs> are the tool. for modeling uh, dynamic processes.
Okay, so let me explain what I mean by that. So an example of a dynamic process would be what if we took uh, in this inside of this room, what if we took a really, really hot metal sphere, really hot metal sphere, and it was sitting here, and it was radiating heat? You know, you might ask, well, how hot is the sphere after a certain amount of time? Or what's the heat distribution on the sphere and in the room after a certain amount of time? Okay, at first, if the sphere was glowing red hot, you know, you might be able to feel it. But after a few days or something like that, it probably wouldn't be that hot. Maybe it would have reached, maybe the, the room and the sphere would have reached equilibrium. Okay. Uh, what about something like, suppose that we have a population. Uh, and you could, you could have any kind of population that you want. It could be like, say, humans on the earth or bacteria in a petri dish. And suppose that, uh, you know, life being what it is, life combines with other life and makes more life. So when conditions are favorable, the number of individuals increases. Okay, in particular, the number of individuals increases according to the current size of the population. So that is just, the reason why that is, is that every individual of that population is itself endeavoring to copy itself, right? <laughs> if you have 10 bacteria, all 10 of them are trying to make a copy of themselves. If you have 10 million, all 10 million of them are trying to make a copy of themselves. And the same is true of humans. So differential equations are the tool for modeling such processes. So let's start out with the simplest situation. So this is section 10.1, and these are called separable. Separable differential equations. Probably best to start with an example. <coughs> so suppose that dy dx is equal to 3x squared minus 2x and xy equal to mm, how about 3 and 120 is part of the solution is a solution. Find y. Okay. So now this question I've I've asked you a question just like this at the beginning of this of of the course actually. So so you are, in fact, prepared already to do this exercise. So let me show you what I mean. So in the first place, I could take dy dx is 3x squared minus 2x. And now, the dy and the dx, they're written symbolically like fractions, but you should understand that they're not fractions uh, in the sense that 3 over 4 is a fraction, for example. Uh, but symbolically, they can be treated like fractions in the following way. As follows. So what I want you to observe about this equation is that notice that all the y stuff is on the left-hand side. And all x stuff
is on the right hand side. The name for the condition, for this condition, where you're able to separate all the Y stuff from all the X stuff, this is called a separable dif differential equation. Separable. There's lots of differential equations that aren't separable, and we're going to talk about them, but for now we're talking about this easiest kind, separable. Y's have been separated from the X's. Okay, so now we have dy. How do we recover y from dy? How do we get it back? Well, you apply the antiderivative operation to both sides. Well, what's the antiderivative of dy? Why? And what's the antiderivative of 3x squared minus 2x dx? What's the antiderivative of that term with respect to x? x cubed minus x squared. Yeah, and then I'll need a plus c. So sort of strictly speaking, because there were two antiderivatives, I'd have a constant over here and a constant over here, but then I could just combine them together into this one constant. So you really just need one. So this right here, this is called the general solution. But we want a particular solution. So can someone uh, explain what I mean by that? This is a general solution, but this is, we don't want the general solution. We want a particular one. And how will we know that we have the one that we want? Mm -hmm. So to determine C, we'll use this piece of information. that when you, when you substitute into this equation, x is 3 and y is 120, it should be true. So that's 27 minus 9 plus c. So that's 18. Move it to the other side. 102 is c. <coughs> so y equal to x cubed minus x squared plus 102 is the solution. Any question about this? So now, I've literally, I've literally given you questions just like this, and even given you homework exercises just like this, except I phrased them in a slightly different way. I've, the way that they were phrased at the beginning of the semester was like this. It was suppose that the derivative of a function, f, is 3x squared minus 2x, and that the original function evaluated at 3 is 120. And then my question was not find y, but find f of x. 
So you can go back and look at written homework like 10 or something, and there it is, staring, staring at you. Okay. So now, if these are, these are too easy, we're going to deal with more complicated versions of this. But this is the general idea. Somehow we're going to deal with some derivative stuff, and somehow we're going to be able to separate the x's from the y's, and then anti-differentiate. Okay. <clears throat> Suppose that a population P of what kind of creatures are we going to have? What kind of creatures? Gliders? population of gliders, like those little flying rodent thingies, a population of gliders <coughs> uh, has rate of change given by the derivative of the population in time is, um, say, 20 exponential 0 0.05 t. And the initial population So what, what, what is a, a reasonable initial population for a glider colony? It's irrelevant as long as it's positive and an integer, right? We don't want fractional gliders. 10? So suppose this is the case. So from a population of 10 individuals. So I want you to solve for P. I want you to determine um, when the population is some notable value, how about a thousand, and some other notable value. How about a million? So we're wondering. <clears throat> Maybe we'll say t is in years. I have no idea if that's reasonable for gliders. So our, our question in the end, I guess, is that supposing this is true about gliders, how long, how long can we go from 10 to a million of them? OK. So for part one. How do we how do we do it? How do we solve for p? So we can start with this equation. dp dt is twenty exponential 0 0.05 t. And we'd like to use the same technique that we used on the previous page, right? That'd be good. So have we separated the variables? Are the variables separated? What, what are we trying, which, what variables are we trying to separate from each other? P's and T's, yeah. We want the P's to be separate from the T's. So we can do the, we can get that DT fraction, uh, differential on the other side by treating it like a fraction. 
So dp is 20 exponential 0 0.05t dt. So do you observe that, ah, that separated the variables. That's nice. OK. So then the antiderivative of dp is antiderivative of exponential of 0 0.05 tdt. So what's antiderivative dp? It's p. And then how about what's antiderivative of all that? So in the first place, that 20 just hangs out because it's a constant multiplier. What's the exponential, what's the antiderivative of exponential 0 0.05 TDT? Very good. And then plus a constant. So what was used there is that a, a common specialization of the exponential rule is that the antiderivative of the exponential, and instead of just x by itself, but you put a constant times x, Well, that's equal to exponential of that constant, x. Over that constant. So that, that's what was used there. So simplifying that a little bit. Uh, that'd be 400. Exponential is 0 0.05 t plus a constant. So have we answered part one? That's the general solution. But we want to know, we're, we're able to find the specific solution, the particular solution. Okay, so to determine C, we can't just substitute for P, we have, to, we have to also know what T is. So you're telling me that we know that P is 10, okay, at, at zero. And how do you know that, how do you know that the, the, the time is zero? This is the initial population. So if we substitute P and T in there, that, that P and T in there, and then we get 10 equal to 400 times the exponential of 0 plus a constant. The exponential of 0 is 1, so negative 390 is C. So as a result, Uh, what? So as a result, P is 400 exponential 0 0.05 T minus 390. Okay. So that's the answer to part one. So to part two. What are we supposed to do for that? Mm -hmm. We want to solve 
P equal to a thousand for T. <clears throat> okay. So one thousand is four hundred exponential zero point zero five T minus three nine. <coughs> okay, so how do you go about how do you go about solving for T? So 1390 is 400, and then divide by 400. <coughs> uh, so 1390 over 400 is exponential of 0 0.05t, log of both sides. So log of 1390 over 400 is 0 0.05t mm -hmm. So therefore t is log of 1390 over 400 and then all of that over 0 0.05 Five. Okay, and then from there is <coughs> calculator's business. So my calculator is saying uh, T is twenty four point nine. So if, if that's years, that doesn't seem reasonable, right? They're rodents. Maybe that's months. I have no idea about the gestation habits and of, of gliders. Maybe months. <clears throat> Maybe months. From 10 in a matter of 24 months, 24.9, just over two years, you can get to a population of 1,000. Okay, now the question is, okay, then how long would it take to get to a million? Well, this algebra right here, there's nothing sacred about that thousand, right? I think that you would probably believe me if I said that, well, it would be just like that, except it would be natural log of a million plus 390 <coughs> over 400 over 0 0.05. So instead of a thousand plus three ninety, it'd be a million plus three ninety. <clears throat> now let's see what the calculator has to say about that. So if this if this really is months, and it really does take twenty four point nine months to get to a thousand, how long will it take to get to a million? Does anyone care to guess? It'll take like two hundred and forty months or something like that. 10 years? If it took two years to get to a thousand, how long will it take to get to a million? My calculator says 156 and a half. Uh, months. So it would take 10 years to get to a million. Is that right? One million has six zeros in it, yeah. <clears throat> so that's interesting. So it, took, it takes 24 months to get to 1,000, but it only takes uh, what? Six times that long to get to a million. Wow, that's a lot. Okay. 
So we could, we could go on and plot it further and say, well, how long would it take to get to a billion and a, a trillion of them? Okay. So that was uh, that kind. So now we're going to talk about uh, an old story. So there's a, a person in history, uh, in the history of science and politics and things like that, named Thomas Malthus. So are you familiar with this person, Malthus? A little bit of an obscure figure. Uh, but you, you might have heard something that's named after him called a Malthusian trap or a Malthusian catastrophe. So the Malthusian catastrophe is the following kind of idea. That, well, we can see, anyone can plainly see, that um, when organisms are, have good conditions, like, for example, when rabbits, that is to say, hares, rabbits, were first introduced to Australia, they just bred all over the place, destroying ecological niches that had existed in Australia for a long time. And they just multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. And Malthus is considering this, and he, he, Malthus comes to the conclusion that we're all going to die. <laughs> Human beings are, 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 are reproducing so fast that there's going to be so many of us that we're all just going to die. We'll be shoulder to shoulder in just a matter of decades. <laughs> So, so Thomas Malthus comes to this conclusion. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go through the calculus of how Malthus came to this conclusion. But we're also going to, we're also going to go through the calculus that explains why he's just mistaken. Right? Because after all, Malthus was doing his thing, I think, in the 1600s or something like that. And if Malthus was right, we'd already be you know, there, 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 we wouldn't have enough room for each of us to take a breath. We'd all be sitting side by side <laughs> if, if Thomas Malthus had, his, had it right. Okay, <clears throat> so here's the deal about reproducing, populations of reproducing individuals. And let's make it simple. Uh, we, we'll talk about, you can imagine humans, but I'm going to say bacteria. So a bacteria is a nice... Uh, organism for this thought experiment because the way bacteria reproduce is they they um, they get a little bit bigger they consume a bunch of stuff they get a little bit bigger and then they squeeze in half and now each one uh, has half the half the volume half the content of the of the parent cell the two daughter cells are more or less identical after this so where there was one there's now two and now that you have two bacteria, each of these is going after the exact same goal. They, they, they both consume some nutrients, expand in size, and then cleave, and then where there was two, there's now four. So the thing, the thing that I want you to see is that if there's 100 bacteria, they are each going toward the end of reproducing themselves. They no longer care about their comrades. The only purpose of a bacteria is just to make another copy of itself. And that's what it does. If there's a hundred of them, you've got a hundred bacteria try each trying to make a copy. If you've got a hundred million of them, you've got a hundred million of them each trying to make a copy. The, the same more or less is true of human beings. So let's consider, at the present time in the United States, there's about 300 million people. There's more than that, but let's just call it 300 million, just for the sake of a round number. So 300 million. Let's further suppose that the yearly growth rate in the United States is around 2%. That's actually pretty accurate. That's actually a pretty accurate estimate. Um, when you include immigration to the United States, it's just over 2%. So if there's 300 million people in the United States right now, and then we set a clock, and 
watched and watched the population. What would the population be in a year from now? With a 300 percent, 300 uh, million population now and a two percent growth rate. What would that mean? How could we calculate it? How about 300 times 1.02? Why 1.02? Yeah, because we're adding 2%, right? So we'll have 100 We're assuming people don't die. Or, or that the 2% accounts for all the deaths and everything else. So 102% of 300 is 306. So that means that if we have exactly 300 million people now, and if we have exactly a 2% population growth rate, that this time next year, there will be 6 million more people. Now the population of the DFW area, the metropolitan statistical area, is about 6 million. So what that's telling you is that these entirely reasonable numbers are telling you that in a year's time, we would have enough new people to populate the entire DFW area, a new, an entire new one, right? Not including the, this one. They can't have this one. <laughs> this one's ours. They're going to have to go make their own. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. <clears throat> well, how many people are currently on the planet? In fact, it's over seven now. Seven billion. So that's 7,000 million people on the planet. More than that, but let's just round it down to 7,000 million. And if we, if we stick with the 2% growth rate, 2% growth rate, and we multiply 7,000 million by 1.02, that means that this time next year, there's going to be 140 million new people. 140 million new people. Wow. That's because, more or less, all of the adults in the world are endeavoring to make new people. More or less. So, to give you a sense of scale for 140 million people, 140 million people is approximately the size of Japan. Yeah. Like the whole shebang. <laughs> so, in a year's time, due to the natural population growth rate, there's going to be enough people to populate a new Japan. That's because all those original Japanese people are still going to be there. Okay, so what's the distinction between these numbers, right? So in the United States, we're saying there's going to be 6 million new people, but on the total, there's going to be 140 million people, 140 million new people. What's the, what's the distinction between, between these numbers? Why is the one so much bigger than the other? Yeah, because it's part and whole, right? It's just that when you're talking about the United States, you're talking about a relatively small group of people, 300, only 300 million people. Whereas when you're talking about the whole planet, we're talking 7,000 million people. Okay. <clears throat> what I want you to see from this is that when reckoning population, the population changes in proportion to its current size. So if its current size is small, its change is small. If its current size is big, its change is big. Okay. <clears throat> so this is called proportional growth. Suppose a population P <coughs> grows in proportion K to its current size.
So that's saying that the time derivative of the population, the rate of change of the population, is kp. The rate at which the population changes is proportional to the current size of the population. Let's solve this. For p. <coughs> so we want to take that equation and solve for p. And we want to use the same techniques that we've already used uh, a couple of times. So what do we need to do? Fishing for an S word. Separate. <laughs> A polite S word. <laughs> right. We want to separate the variables. What are the variables? <coughs> P and T are the variables. K is a, a constant, a proportionality constant. So we want to separate P and T. I'll do something. So dP is K, P, dT. So have we separated the variables? We haven't separated them. Which variables are we trying to separate? The P's and the T's. So have we gotten all the P's on one side and all the T's on the other side? Not yet. Right? So how can we get all the P's on one side? No, we can't, we can't do any antiderivative business until they're separated. Yeah, we'll divide by P. So 1 over P dP is K dT. So now do you observe? Ah, we've got all the P's on the left and all the t's on the right. That k is just a constant, so it's happy the way it is. So now we can now we can anti-differentiate. Oops. Okay, so if the right-hand side is easy enough, well, so is the left-hand side, I guess. What's the antiderivative of the left-hand side? Very good. Log of absolute value of p. What is the antiderivative of the right-hand side? kt, and then plus a constant, because k itself is a constant. Okay, now, I'm going to drop the absolute value, which under typical generic circumstances, that would not be okay, but why is that okay here? Yeah, because we're talking about a population, right? I like to imagine, you know, what, what, would, it, what would it be like to have a negative individual? <laughs> that, that would mean that, that would mean that if you ever found an equal and opposite positive individual, if they ever ran into each other, they would both cease to exist right then and there. Right? Just out of existence. Okay, now we want to solve for P, right? That was the, 
that was the request. So how do we solve for P from here? How do you get P by itself? And th this is a, we've done all the calculus, right? When we got to this line, all the calculus was over. <laughs> this is now an algebraic matter. Yes. So specifically, specifically, uh, I'll do it like this, that it should be P is exponential KT plus a constant. So the thing that was used here is that when you have um, when you have that the log of y is equal to x, you can solve for y by keeping the y on its side and the x on its side. But when the logarithm changes sides, on the left-hand side it's logarithm and on the right-hand side it's exponential. Okay, then I'll use the rules of exponents to say that this is exponential of kt multiplied by the exponential of c. That's how exponents work. And then I'll per, uh, commute that e to c to the front. So now, we'll make one more observation, and that is to say, supposing the initial population is denoted as P with a subscript zero, is that what your book will, will write? Yeah, it'll be fine. That is to say, at time zero, the population is P0. Well, P0 would be exponential of C multiplied by exponential of K times zero. So that'd be a zero. And what's the exponential of zero? One. So this is the exponential of C. And therefore, the solution to this problem is that the population at any time t is the initial population multiplied by the exponential of kt. Hmm. Let's try and understand what that means now. So if, if k is a positive number, if k is a positive number, that is to say that there's a positive growth uh, rate in the population. If you were to plot population versus time, then you'd have the initial population is here. zero and then the population from here would grow exponentially like this and when conditions are good this is what is observed in nature and so Thomas Malthus was thinking like oh wait a second it's the 1600s and there's about a hundred million of us alive right now that means that by the year 2000 there's going to be there's going to be billions of us and there's no way we can feed ourselves 
Of course, the mistake is that, no, actually we can and are doing it. That's one of the mistakes. The other mistake is that, is that human beings, just like every other organism, do in fact reach equilibrium with their surroundings when they run out of resources. So, so Malthus took a look at this and, and said, oh no. So any question about this one? This is the proportional growth model. Okay, let's think about this for uh, in a slightly different way. Okay, so we're, we're doing this population model. So now I'm going to do, that, that was kind of a population thing. Now I'm going to add in a, a different one. So this is a purely abstract example. So how about, um, please solve y <coughs> Uh, dy dx is x squared, and I want the general solution only. What does that mean, general solution only? speculate about what that might mean? Plus C. Yeah, it means that uh, when you get to the plus C, you're done. Don't go any further than that. Okay, so what can we do? Separate, right? same thing we always do. So Y dy is x squared dx. So were we able to separate the variables? Yeah. Once you've achieved separation, then what? <coughs> yeah. Well, the left-hand side would be y squared over 2. The right-hand side, x cubed over 3. And then plus c. So I, I gave you this one, this exercise, for a couple reasons. One reason is that I want to give your brain a moment to relax while we're talking about these population thingies, because we're about to start another one. Uh, another reason is I want you to observe that the answer to the question, uh, th that this is the answer to the question and that it is not necessary to solve for y. Among other reasons, I didn't request you to solve for y. I just want you to solve the equation. Okay. So now let's get back to this population business. So a far more realistic, um, a far more realistic population situation is that each environment has a certain optimum number of individuals. For example, current estimates are that the Earth Unless we, unless we come up with some interesting new physics and, and new science, that the Earth's carrying capacity for human beings is probably on the order of 100 billion individuals. That's about how many we'll be able to fit without significant strife among us, like fighting over clean water. So. So let's, let's say that that's, I'm not, sh I'm not c convinced that's a fact, but for the sake of argument, let's say it's a fact. That the carrying capacity of the Earth is 100 billion individuals. 
Well, the way the way population, the way carrying capacity works, and the way populations are with respect to them, if the carry, if the population is currently less than the carrying capacity, what will happen to that population? <coughs> For example, if the Earth can truly support a hundred billion individuals, and at this time there's seven billion, what's going to happen to our population? It's going to go up. It's going to happen. Suppose that, suppose that um, our population, that, that the carrying capacity of the Earth is 100 billion, and that at the present time the population is 120 billion. What will happen to the population? It's going to have to decrease. <laughs> Since we're talking ab abstractly, we'll, uh, we'll, we could say it'll decrease in the most polite and peaceful way possible. <laughs> Realistically, through wars and things like that. Okay. So when a population is, is below the carrying capacity of its environment, that population will increase. And when the population is over the carrying capacity of that environment, the population will decrease. So, so, furthermore, if we were, si since the population is right now 7 billion <coughs> and the carrying capacity is 100 billion, our population be should be able to increase really pretty quick until it gets to 100 billion, at least right now. But what if we had like, like, 99 billion already, and 1 billion, 100 billion was the most we could possibly do. Well, the population would still increase, but it would have to increase kind of slow then, right? Because if you overshot it, that could be bad, right? So if the difference between the optimal number, the carrying capacity is big, then the population should increase rapidly. If the difference is small, the population should increase slowly. And, by, and, and similar things but pointing down, if we're, if we're way over the carrying capacity, like if we have 200 billion people and we can only support 100 billion, people are gonna have to die off quick. Similarly, if we, ha if we have say 100 billion and 1,000, well, that extra thousand, I guess, can die out kind of slow. So, here's the model that, that encodes all of that kind of thing together. <clears throat> so, this is the carrying capacity model. So suppose that population P changes in proportion K to the difference between the current population and the carrying capacity. So we'll call N the carrying capacity. When we were talking about Earth and human beings, N would be 100 billion. Suppose the population, blah, blah, blah. So DP, DT, DP, DT is proportional 
to the difference. Okay, so now the difference between blah blah blah. And I want you to help me think about it. What is it that I'm supposed to write in those parentheses so that I'll so that it will be correct? So I'm leaving those open ones there in case you go back and read the notes and I'm going to fill these ones in. What do I need to write in those parentheses so that it will be correct? So let's, let's remember that if you're under the carrying capacity, if the population is under the current carrying capacity, then what should happen to the population? It should increase. If you're over the carrying capacity, what should happen to the population? It should decrease. And further, I'd like for you to remember your Calculus 1 knowledge that dpdt, just abstractly, if dpdt is positive, what does that say about what does that say about the population if it happens that dpdt is positive? It's increasing. So, for example, uh, the at the present time, the time rate of change of the human population on Earth is positive because we're having more and more humans all the time. Whereas the time rate of change of something like black rhinos is decreasing because they're on the verge of going extinct. Okay. And recall furthermore that DPDT, when a derivative is negative, this means that P is decreasing. So what goes in here? That's it. Now let's think about this for a moment when we're talking about humans. So if, it's a, if it is a fact that the carrying capacity of the Earth is 100 billion, then that would mean that this number, in billions anyway, is 100. That would be the carrying capacity of the Earth. <coughs> now the current population of the Earth is 7 billion. So if this were 7, if P were 7, then the difference between these two would be 93, so that this whole thing would be positive. So does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. If the carrying capacity of the Earth is 100 billion and we're currently at 7, then our population should be increasing. Is it increasing? It is. Okay, so at least that part makes sense. Now suppose, suppose that in a different circumstance, somehow maybe we got to like 130 nine billion people. But the carrying capacity of the Earth was only a hundred. Then the difference between these two would be negative. And the derivative would be negative, which would mean that if we ever found ourselves in that position, the population would have to decrease. Okay. Well, let's solve this. Let's solve this for P. And we're going to do it the same way uh, that we've done so many times. So I'll start out by saying that dp, dp is, uh, watch, k times n minus p dt. So have we separated the variables? So what are the variables? P 
and T. So have we separated the P's and the T's? <coughs> now we've still got P's right here. So I'm going to divide by N minus P. Remember, N is a constant and K is a constant. <clears throat> so we've separated the N's and the P's now. That now that we've achieved separation, we can anti-differentiate. The right-hand side is easy enough. We've done it something just like it already several times. So the right-hand side is kt plus a constant. What can we do with the left-hand side? It's going to look something like that, but to get it to get it to get it to be exactly right, let's do a substitution. Let's say that u is n minus p. So if u is n minus p, then what's du? quite. What's, th what's the derivative of n minus p with respect to p, assuming that n, n is constant? N. Ne so this would be, right, negative dp, like that. The n differentiates away, and then the derivative of negative p is negative 1, so negative dp. So then we could write du over negative 1 is dp. <clears throat> OK. So as a result of that, we get what? Uh, antiderivative 1 over u, and then du over negative 1 is kt plus a constant. And then the negative 1, we can ignore that for a moment. What is the antiderivative of 1 over u du? It's the log 1. So we get negative log absolute value of u is kt plus a constant. So that would be negative log absolute value of n minus p, because that's what u is, is kt plus a constant. OK. So now, uh, log of n minus p, absolute value, is negative kt minus c. And now we can get to n minus p absolute value is exponential negative kt times exponential of negative c. OK. Now suppose from here we want to solve for p. Because remember, that was our task. What I want you to observe is that in contrast, in contrast to the last example when we were talking about proportional growth without reference to carrying capacity, in the last discussion we were able to drop the absolute value because it was absolute value of p and p is a non-negative quantity. 
How about this? Can we drop the absolute value here? We cannot because it, it, is, it is reasonable for n minus p to be positive. It is also reasonable for n minus p to be negative. What does it mean when n minus p is positive? What, in, in the story, what does that mean if n minus p is positive? It, it means that we started in a situation where the population should increase. Whereas if n minus p is negative, that means that we started in a situation in which the population should decrease. So we don't have time to do it now, but next time we're going to break this into the two possibilities, the, po the, the possibility where population should increase and the, po and the possibility where population should decrease. And then, just like Malthus, we, sh we, we said, oh, Malthus didn't have it right. This is, this is a revised model by someone whose name I don't even recall. This model is not right either. <laughs> and then, I mean, th this is an interesting model for various things, but it's not right for human dynamics. We'll finally get the right population model on Thursday. Okay, so have a nice uh, Tuesday.